Well, about two weeks ago, Saturday, it all started with me. I just couldn't, decided I couldn't take anymore, so I tried to commit suicide. But then after I got out, they recommended that I come here. So I came here immediately and began care, and it just seemed like a whole new life. Like, you know, just like everything had changed. And when I met Mrs. Sumner and Dr. McMillan, I was just, you know, real tickled. And then I started coming here, and then last Saturday, as you know, I had another small breakdown. But all I could think of was coming back here to the people where I, you know, where I thought I could, you know, begin a new life. And I, I don't know, it's just been like something new to me ever since I've come here. And I've been emotionally stable, and I've been able to accept the fact that life is worth living. How did you try, if I may ask? Well, I got a razor, and I tried to slash my wrists, my arms, and uh, my leg and my chest. But then I figured after I'd been through all that and come here and saw all these other people, I figured that it was worth another try instead of, you know, just trying to end my life. I found out that you don't just end your life just by trying to commit suicide. That's what you did? Yes. My eyes here and on one leg and my wrists and all up here. So it was Saturday, two days ago, yes, you said you had a... Mm -hmm. And then I had a small breakdown. I had a shakes and convulsions, so they took me back to the psychiatric ward. And then uh, they released me this, well, this afternoon, about 2.30. Just a couple of hours ago. Yes. I think Evelyn and I both probably would like to know how it is that uh, at the tender age of 20, you can reach the point of feeling it isn't worth going on. Well, I was living, I don't know, I was living with these nuns, and they were part of it, and I just, I just figured I couldn't handle the situation any longer. I was just tired of living, tired of everybody, t just tired, period. So I figured if I took my life, it would end it for me and for everybody. And then, my, you know, I figured everything would stop right there, and everybody would have no more worry. But I found out different as I was rehabilitating to come back here. What do you find here at the day treatment center that makes you feel there is hope? Well, there's people here with similar problems and you just feel like you're part of them. I mean, they, you know, you're accepted. It's not as if, you know, well, they all have problems and you figure that your problem could co sort of coincide with theirs. And then the, doctor, the doctors and the therapists here are just wonderful. I mean, they seem to understand, more or less, what's happening. Have you made close friends with some of the people here? Yes, I have. I've gotten to know quite a few of them, and we get along rather well. We go on outings together, and we eat lunch together, and we just sit around together. We talked with your daughter at some length earlier, shortly after she came back here from the hospital. What do you think about her condition? Well, I feel that my daughter has a very deep-rooted condition that needs help by somebody other than her mother and father. Is she your only child? No, I have a son, 12 years old. Do you feel in a situation of this sort, Mrs. Dye, uh, at all responsible, at all to blame, perhaps, for what's happened? Yes, in a way, I do. I think I overplayed the part of mother. I think I tried to be too perfect of a mother. And I didn't really shoulder Linda with the responsibility that she should have had from earlier warnings because they went on through public school and they went on through even the doctor himself, the pediatrician. She felt that she should stay with the pediatrician. She went into her teens. Linda is five foot five and a half. She kept insisting that she wear the miniature size. She would say, I am a petite. Let's go to the petite shop. Little things that just aren't natural and yet are not really, shall we say, mental problems. She wanted to stay a child? A child. She wanted to stay a child. And uh, what with the thumb sucking and things like that, why I sort of kept putting two and two together. She told us about her suicide attempt the other day, which led to her being taken back to the county hospital. Did you know what was happening at that time? Could you see you know, trouble signs, warning signs, perhaps? 
Yes, uh, I could see them to the point that when Linda reached 19, she thought she should have a car. Well, we couldn't see any legitimate excuse why she shouldn't because she had a good job. But when she had three severe wrecks in one year, we could see this child or adult should not have this car and the insurance company agreed with us. But yet, we took a security insurance thinking this will straighten her out. Then, she said, if I am let to have my own apartment, I can do better, I will do better. I will improve myself. Well, we let her have her own apartment, and consequently, she wasn't ready to face the world. She couldn't hold a job. You supported her at that time? No, we had her to sell the car. I told her, I said, Linda, you're taking the step over the threshold, just mm -hmm. as sure as you're getting married. If you feel that you are old enough and capable of maintaining an apartment, she moved into a girls' club, but it was yet her own apartment. I said, you must learn to support yourself. You have some savings, you have some bonds, now, by selling your car, you will have enough for two months. Seems like a, a curious contradiction, Mrs. Dye, between the description of a young lady who wanted to be a child, even though she was growing out of childhood, and then a young lady uh, who, you say, suddenly wanted to be an adult on her own, with a car, apartment, and so forth. Was there a sudden change, or...? Well, that, I should have sensed it then, and I should have asked for help for her then, and I didn't, because you see, all these things that she was going to do, she didn't do. She had two good jobs. She was let go because she was immature. And uh, instead of coming back and confiding in us, she went about it in a childish way. You think she was afraid to? Yes, I imagine that there was a certain amount of fear, and I fear that fear itself brought on the suicide attempt. Did you know about that in the hours before she attempted to take her own life? No, that came as a great shock because I had just talked to her, oh, I would say a half hour previous to this. Have you noticed since she began working here uh, a change in her? There has been a vast change. It, it just seems incredible that this can and happen, and I don't think that if I were to tell anybody how much of a change there would be that they could hardly believe it unless there were Dr. McMillan and Mrs. Sumner to back me up on this. And I'm sure he feels the same way. What do you think the outlook is now for your daughter? Linda has a very bright outlook. She really does. She just all of a sudden feels, I'm somebody, and I'm going to do it without my mother. She feels that she is, Linda has had training in nurses. She has worked as a psychiatric aide. She has had a training in other fields. Now, all of a sudden, she feels those were not her fields. She feels she's going to find one here, and she's willing to stay here until she finds that field. And even though she believes she can make it without her mother, you don't take this as uh, an affront of any kind? Absolutely not. This should be a perfectly normal reaction for a 20-year-old girl. Well, thank you, Mrs. Ty. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm sure you know you have all the best wishes of all of us for both you and your daughter. Well, thank you very much.